What is every machinist's worst nightmare? Well, yeah, okay. Let me start over. What is every machinist's second worst nightmare? That's right, making a huge mistake most of the way through a complex part. But in the machining world, whenever there's a mistake, there's almost always an opportunity. Don't believe me? Then buckle up, because I have a bit of a harrowing adventure for you. In my last video, I walked through the process of reverse engineering the D1-5 cam lock mechanism on my lathe. My goal was to use that design to make a rotary table chuck adapter. I'll begin with the biggest, most complex piece, the body. I ordered this material several months ago, but during the design process I called out 4140 steel. I completely forgot that this is actually 01 tool steel, which I suppose is even better. I feel like it's been forever since I've used the lathe, so I'm pretty excited to spend some time on my favorite machine again. This starting stock is 6 inches in diameter, so I'll need to flip the jaws around to properly hold on to it. I'm going to cut the taper side of the adapter first, since it's probably the most critical feature on the whole part. To get there though, I'll first face the stock, turn down the outside diameter, and then hog away another half inch of the face, leaving a slightly oversized boss to form the taper on. All that heavy cutting has left this material pretty hot, so while that cools down, I'll set up for the next operation. To cut the taper, I'll need to set the compound slide to an angle of 7 degrees, 7 minutes, and 30 seconds, which isn't exactly possible with the built-in scale. I'll get it close and set up a dial indicator on the compound slide and rest it against the quill of the tailstock. Some quick trig tells me that for this angle, a half an inch stroke on the compound should result in a change of 62 thousandths on the indicator. After a few taps with a hammer, I hit that dead on. No pun intended. Now to start whittling away at the boss to form the taper. The diameter of this feature is very critical for it to properly align the chuck once mounted. The tolerance window is only 5 ten thousandths, so I'll have to take my time here. As I start to get close, I use the pin measurement method I used in the previous video to determine how much further I need to go. Then take one final cut leaving about two thou over, and also cutting a tool radius relief where the taper meets the face. The excess I left is just enough to let me finish grind this into tolerance. Since my measurement method is a little error prone, I also want to verify another way. This drive plate uses the same cam lock mounting style, so I'll remove all the studs and use it as a template. You can see that with the two thou left on the taper, there's still a bit of play in the plate. To take it the rest of the way, I'll start manually grinding little by little, periodically checking the measurements and also the fitment with the plate. Once the micrometer reads true and there's also no hint of wiggle, wobble, or rocking in the template, I feel pretty confident I hit the mark. The next feature to add is the inch and a quarter through bore. This is primarily for clearance in the event that I have a longer part that needs to stick through the back of the chuck when this is mounted to the rotary table. After maxing out the diameter with my largest drill, I'll switch to the boring bar and take it the rest of the way. One last thing is to add 50 thou chamfers on both the outer edge and the edge of the tapered boss. These weren't included in my original design, but they both look better and prevent me from cutting myself on the sharp edges when I handle this part. I'm not quite ready to cut this part to thickness yet, but while I have it mounted, I'll go as far as I can with the parting tool. Or not. For whatever reason, no combination of speeds or feeds seems to work. The chatter and vibrations are so bad that it's actually kicking the gearbox out of gear. I guess I'll be cutting this whole diameter on the bandsaw. Great. I can't wait. Now you might be wondering why I used stock so thick in the first place. Well, I happen to have a good reason, and it has to do with the rotary table. I'll be mounting this part to the table for all of the hole operations. But when the table is in the vertical position, there needs to be room for the mill's quill. Leaving that extra material on the body bolsters out the end, giving me the clearance I need. I'm not quite ready to mount to the table though, since the bottom face is still untouched. So it's back to the lathe. This time around I'll need the four jaw chuck. I'll flip the jaws on this one too, and also wrap them in aluminum to protect the already finished surface. The part once mounted is likely off-center and parallel from the spindle axis. So setting an indicator near the chuck lets me adjust the concentricity with the four independent jaws. 
Then indicating further out tells me how straight the part is and how much to correct with a hammer. Then I just bounce back and forth making smaller and smaller adjustments until I see zero deviation in both positions. Now, after all that meticulous adjusting, I can take a single pass on the face to bring it parallel to the finished side. But that's not all I'm going to do. While I'm here, I might as well take advantage of the situation and add a locating feature to help quickly center the part on the rotary table. This boss is similar to the one I'll ultimately make on the bottom of the finished part, so I'm considering this a bit of a practice run since I'll basically only get one shot at that. My final pass is about one thou large, but the part is also somewhat warm, so it will likely shrink. Let's see how it fits. Just the slightest bit of resistance going in and absolutely no play. Perfect. Time to change gears and spend some quality time at the mill. Since all my coming operations will use this table mounted in both the horizontal and vertical positions, it's absolutely critical that the table be set perfectly square. Which of course means I get to use the indicator and hammer again. With that cinched down, I'll find the center of the table using the coax indicator on the center bore. And zero both my axes on the DRO. One last step before mounting the part is to set the table scale and dial to zero. This is important to do now since all the coming cuts reference the same zero point. On to mounting the part. I'd like to not have to remove any of the clamps as I go through the different setups, so their positions are going to be somewhat important. You can see on the drawing there are really only three spots that will be out of the way. I'll mark these on a protractor and move over to the part to transfer the markings. Setting up the clamps though, I run into my first problem. Where I need them to be, there aren't any T-slots to mount to. To get around this, I'll just have to set my new zero point to 30 degrees on the scale. I'll also go ahead and translate all my angular positions to the new reference to spare a fatal mistake later on. Now I can clamp everything down for good using small pieces of aluminum to protect the finish of the part. The first operation is to drill the six 25-30 seconds holes for the studs. After center drilling for each position, I'll switch to an intermediate size and drill to depth. My thinking is that this will ease the load on the larger drill, allowing it to cut a little nicer. That intermediate drill removed my lead-in chamfer, so I'll drop a new one in each hole, switch the drill chuck out for the final drill, set my zero, engage the quill feed, and let her rip. The feed does a good job of keeping the drill engaged, producing a nice consistent chip, but also has the advantage of giving my arms a little bit of a break. Manual machining can be a workout sometimes. I'd like to drop a chamfer on each of these, but being so close to the tapered boss, there isn't room to get in here. So a simple deburr will have to suffice. The next set of holes will be both tapped and counterbored for the cam retaining screws. These are offset from the first set of holes by 14 degrees and 55 minutes. Then the process is smooth sailing. Center drill, pre-drill for the 5 16 tap, use an end mill for the counterbore. Whoa, wait a minute, that wobbling doesn't look good. I thought mounting in a drill chuck would be alright for a straight operation like this. Note to self, absolutely no more mills and chucks. Not what I wanted, but it will still function the same. I guess I'll have to just live with this. I noticed the screws I ordered have a short section of unformed threads near the head. So to give a little clearance for these, I'll drill out about 50 thou, and then move on to tapping. From here it's just rinse and repeat on the remaining 5 holes. Though I did take a slightly different approach and batch the operations by tooling rather than hole. This saves a little time with the number of depth setups and shuttling the table up and down. The final operations of this setup are the peripheral slots for the hold down hardware. These slots come in from the sides and are counterboard to give clearance for the screw heads. A 3 quarter inch mill takes care of the counterboard section in two passes, then I swap to a half inch mill for the rest of the slot. And of course I can't move on without dropping a little chamfer on the tops of these. That's about everything I can do from this angle. With the exception of one hiccup, that went alright, but now it's time to turn everything on its side. And I mean in more ways than one. To cut the six cam holes, the rotary table needs to be stood up on its end. Like before, it's important that everything be aligned square to the mill axis, so out comes the indicator once again. After tapping everything into position, the Y direction is set, as is the Z, which fortunately didn't require any adjustment. Good to know that the faces of this rotary table are properly square as they should be. To zero the spindle, I'll position one of the stud holes at top dead center and insert a snug reference pin. I can get a touch on this with the edge finder and then offset to the center. Then get one more touch in the face of the adapter. These six cam holes are 7 eighths in diameter with a 2 thou tolerance window and also flat on the bottom. 
So to achieve this, I think I'll use the 7 8 end mill. But first I'll do like I did before and center drill and pre-drill each hole to depth to give some relief for that big end mill. I'm thinking that since I'll have to intersect with the cross holes, the end mill will be less susceptible to drifting off center compared to a regular drill. But I still expect a ton of force, so as a precaution I'll lock down all the axes. Let's give it a whirl. Eesh, that's a lot of wobble. I suppose I could have stopped and regrouped, but the damage was done as soon as I started cutting. I'd be highly surprised if that's anywhere close to 7 8 now. Oh, only 50 thou over, just a casual 25 times the tolerance limit. Here's a 7 8 pin for reference. There's that punch in the gut feeling sinking in. Well now what? I certainly don't want to start over. There's got to be a way out of this. I'll mull that over for a while and sort out a better approach for the remaining five holes. This time around I think I'll take an incremental approach and start with a half inch mill, then a 5 8 and stopping at a 3 quarter. Still one size away from the final 7 8 Even that approach left me several thou oversized from the last mill I used. Jumping to the 7 8 mill would surely end in disaster once again. It might be asking a bit much, but I do have the 7 8 reamer with a pretty aggressive lead taper. What the heck, let's give it a shot. Well, it certainly looks like it's working. How does it measure? 4 thou over. That's 2 thou over the 2 thou tolerance. I think that's close enough though that I can adjust when I make the cams. I'm going to run with this. Alright, that takes care of 5 out of 6 holes. Now for the one that shall not be named. I was actually talking to my wife about the situation my lack of brain cells created, and she immediately suggested inserting a sleeve. Genius. One of the many benefits of marrying another engineer. To do this properly though, I need to unfubar this foobarred hole just a bit to have a good dimension to make the sleeve to. So I'm going to use the boring head. Do repairs for stupid mistakes count as side projects? Survey says. I want this sleeve to be somewhat substantial, so I'm going to bore this out to a nominal 1 inch. That will give me a 16th wall thickness for the 7 8 hole. After an initial 5 thou pass, you can see just how out of whack my attempt with the end mill ended up. Only about half the circumference was even cleared. I'll take this the rest of the way with incremental steps until I'm 4 thou under 1 inch. This will give me some room to adjust for a press fit sleeve. To make the sleeve, I actually have plenty of 4140 that I ordered to make the cams from. I'll face the normal way and put a slight lead-in chamfer to help with assembly. I'll drill out the center to a 32nd under my nominal 7 8 then switch to a boring bar to take it almost the rest of the way. I say almost because I'm going to leave a few thou for a finish pass with the boring head in the mill. After sanding the outside, I'm right at .998, which leaves me a 2 thou interference. Truthfully, I didn't bother getting into any math, but my gut tells me this is a reasonable press fit for what I need. I'd really, really like to not have to break this setup down though, so I'm going to try and insert the sleeve right here on the mill. Now this next part is a whole cascade of questionable decisions, and I'll admit I'm not entirely sure what came over me. But believe me when I say, I'm not proud. To give myself the best chance of success, I popped the sleeve in the freezer for a bit, and I'm adding a little localized heat around the hole. This will hopefully shrink the sleeve and also expand the hole, making the job a little easier. Once ready, I make the quick transfer and use the quill of the mill like an arbor press to drive the sleeve into place. It starts, but I can already kind of tell it's going to take too much force. Maybe I can remove it. Not a chance. Maybe it will go after all. Don't do that. Alright, that wasn't one of my best moves. I'll fix that in a minute. I still think this will go with a little persuasion though. Hey, it's moving. Go, 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 go. Alright, I'm pretty happy with that. I still need to do some finishing work, but that's going to be difficult without a quill lever. So I'll pause this side project for another side project, resulting from yet another stupid mistake. Good as new, though with it being a little shorter, it's a smidge less likely for me to break again. Before boring the sleeve to final dimension, I decided to measure each of the other five cam bores. And to my surprise, they were all different, some by as much as eight thousandths. 
Maybe it was a bit much for that reamer after all. I think the best thing to do at this point is to bore all six of the holes to a common dimension, so I'm not custom fitting each and every cam. I'll take each hole to an even .900 inches. This is a full 25 thou over the original design, but this will be an easy change on the cams and everything should still function the same. In hindsight, the boring head probably would have been the best tool for this job in the first place. You live and you learn. I'll remove the majority of the protruding sleeve material with the boring head as well. Then switch to a chamfering bit to cut the cam alignment marks on each of the holes. I didn't account for these in the original design, but they will save a lot of headache when I finally get to use this adapter. Say, that looks pretty professional. Now if it weren't for the sleeve, I would be finished on the mill, but I still have to remove the material where it covers the stud and screw holes. So it's back down to the horizontal position where I can re-indicate the table square and re-zero the center. To remove the material interfering with the stud hole, I'll use progressively larger end mills until I get close. Then switch to the boring head once again and take a final pass smoothing out the inner bore. And since it's actually important that all six of these holes be the same diameter, I'll take the same setting around each of the other five and skim past these as well. The other hole that's blocked by the sleeve is for the cam retaining screw. So a simple center drill, pre-drill, and tap takes care of this. The final bit of cleanup on the sleeve is along the outside. Being very careful not to get too close to the finished surface, a single mill pass takes care of this by rotating the rotary table. That should just about do it. After making absolutely certain I have no more milling operations, I break down this setup once and for all. This part is riddled with sharp edges and burrs. So before I spend too much time handling this, I'll spend a little time with a deburring tool and some small files to clean these up. And while I'm at it, I might as well chuck this up in the lathe and clean it up with some sandpaper. Well now, doesn't that look spiffy? This is actually the hole with the repair sleeve and you can hardly tell it apart from the rest. I'll call that a success. Now for the moment I've been dreading since pretty early on in the project. I have to cut this to length on the bandsaw. This is gonna take a while. On the bright side, it leaves me with plenty of time to ponder life, the universe, and whether or not I damaged the rotary table with that hammer incident. Stupidity definitely comes at a cost. A full 26 minutes later, and this thing is finally separated. I'll clean up this mess and chuck this up one last time in the lathe. Like before, this end of the part needs to be parallel and concentric to the other side. So I'll use the two position indicator method to adjust it true. I intentionally cut the material about an eighth of an inch long since I knew the cut would end up super wonky. So the first step is to face this down the thickness and clear the saw marks. That didn't quite clear the marks on the whole face, but it took care of the center section which is the most important. I'll continue to hog out the rest of the material leaving a 3 8 long centering boss just like the temporary one from before. A couple final passes take this to within a thou of my target which should end up just about right once this part cools down. Before dismounting this, I'll drop some quick chamfers on here, deburr all the edges, and give the whole backside a once over with some sandpaper to purdy it up a bit. Let's see how it fits. Very secure, just like the first attempt. I think that just about does it for the most complicated part. Despite making several mistakes and nearly scrapping the whole project, I think I made a pretty decent recovery. But of course every mistake has a price. And in this case, that price is time. The cams and other hardware will have to wait for the next video. Let's just hope things go a little smoother. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.